Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode four of Cold War Conversations. Today we're talking about Cold War espionage, East Germany and Berlin with Spybury host Shane Whaley. Shane runs the Spybury podcast at spybury.com. Their goal is to encourage people to read new spy novels, revisit an old espionage classic and discuss them with their community of like-minded spy fans. It's great fun and if you like spy books, I highly recommend his podcast. So settle in for a wide-ranging and hopefully interesting conversation with my good friend Shane Whaley. Hi Shane, how are you? Fantastic, great to speak to you again Ian, it's been a few months. It has indeed. It's flown by, but uh, loving the Spybury podcast. Thank you. It's very kind. Loving doing it. You know, well, some fantastic people. And, uh, you know, it's devastating my bank account, my bank balance with all the book recommendations. But uh, there's worse ways to spend one's money, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, for, for those people that aren't familiar with Spybury, do you just, can you just tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Um, Spybury is a spy podcast for fans of spy books and spy movies, both fact and fiction. Uh, we interview spy authors, intelligence experts, and spy fans. Our goal is to encourage people to read new spy novels or maybe revisit an old espionage classic and discuss them with our community of like-minded spy fans. Now, the genesis of the podcast um, was I was boring my friends and family to tears when I would read a Lacare book or, you know, a Dayton Berlin game set and match. And oh, I just read this great book by Len Dayton and this happened and that happened. And they're just rolling their eyes because they're, they're not just interested. going Len who? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, a lot of my friends are, you know, love talking about football and women, but not necessarily about espionage and, and fiction and, and Cold War. So I figured, hey, you know, let's, there's got to be other people like me out there. Let's start a podcast and, and a Facebook group and, uh, yeah, we, we're getting, uh, I think it's about 3,000 downloads a week, which I'm very, very uh, humbled and honored that people invest an hour listening to the show. Uh, you know, a vibrant Facebook group with over 600 spy fans who are on there now. And it's a group that I really see as an extension to the show because people come on and talk about the interviews or some of the guests are on there. Um, so it's a continuation of the show and building a community of uh, like-minded fans. And there is some overlap, of course, with the Cold War because my special interest is Berlin, um, particularly the GDR, um, both from the espionage perspective, but also the politics and the aesthetics and, and the history of the GDR. So there's a little bit of Cold War stuff going on there as well. Yeah, we've got, we've got something to talk about there, I think, Shane. A bit of meat there to get into. Um, why the interest in espionage? What, where, where does that come from, Shane? Well, I guess it started off as a kid, like most of us being you know, a big fan of the James Bond movies, uh, and then actually picking up an Ian Fleming book and, and with disgust realizing that the books were very different from the movies. <laughs> um, and then it took a few more years before I picked up Fleming again and really enjoyed the, the, the books of Fleming. That led me on to, to Le Carre. And I realized that as a kid, you know, I really like the, um, the fantasy side of the James Bond world. But as I grew older and understanding life a bit more and certainly reading a lot more history, books like The Spy Who Came From The Cold or Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, um, the Bernard Sampson books under Dayton really resonated with me because these were not super secret agents that, you know, could kill 200 men whilst they're having, you know, a glass of whiskey and a blonde on the other arm. You know, the, these were spies who... Many of them didn't even fire a single shot. In fact, I was just reading Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, I think for the third or fourth time recently, and at the end scene, 
with um, George Smiley, who's going to capture the trader. You know, he, he looks at his gun in his jacket and you don't even know what kind of gun it is. You know, Lakari doesn't go into this whole um, chapter about the, the firearm that the protagonist is using. It doesn't matter. Mm. And that for me kind of really resonated. It was a lot of the geopolitics that went on behind why spies were having to do what they have to do. It's a fascinating subject. And I enjoy both fact and fiction. So I love the real life history and I try and alternate my reading between one, one, you know, nonfiction espionage book and then, then fiction. Yeah. And would you like to be a spy? Not on your life. (laughs) (laughs) Now I was at SpyCon a couple of weeks ago in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was on a panel, a bit of a silly panel really, but it was called Lacare versus Fleming. and, And I said to the audience, when I read Fleming, I want to be a secret agent. When I read Le Carre, I want to be an accountant. Um, because when you, when you read Le Carre spies, there is no way I want to be Alec Lemus. Um, no. There is no way I want to be Ricky Tarr in Tinker Taylor. There's no way I want to be any of these guys who are living on their wits. They're always waiting for the knock on the door. Yeah, you know, it kind of sounds glamorous. You're living behind enemy lines in, in East Berlin. But one slip, one slip and, and you're executed. No, thank you. Yeah, you wouldn't want to have Alec Lemus's liver either, would you, really? No, not at all. In fact, I was just reading today about, about uh, Richard Burton. I was quite surprised. Apparently, Burton said, because there's a scene in The Spy Who From The Cold where um, he is dealing, he hits the shopkeeper, and the shopkeeper's played by Bernard Lee. Mm. And uh, Richard Burton turned around and said, Bernard Lee, of course, went on to play M in the Bond movies, was the only person who ever drunk him under the table. <laughs> <laughs> it's like wow, Bernard oh. Lee, eh? Be some some night out. Yeah. God. Um. So, you you mentioned that uh, you, you're interested in the non-fiction side of um of espionage. Is is there any particular case that um sort of uh, comes to mind? Yeah, I think top of that is the Cambridge Spies for sure. There's been so much written about them, and it's something that now. I think we can all just kind of scratch our heads about how they got away with what they did. Um, so that that's always top of mind. And then, of course, we'll get on to this, but I think one of my favorite, and I'll call it nonfiction in air quotes, uh, is Marcus Wolf's Man Without a Face. And I put it in air quotes because, of course, we, we don't really know what's true and what's not in his book. Mm-hmm. Um, to kind of take him with his word. But for me, that's one of the best espionage uh, books ever written. Yeah, certainly from a biographical point of view. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, it, but it, it it is one of these ones where you do you do sometimes fit. You've got a you're taking it with a pinch of salt. You have to um, because you know, of course, he's not around now. There's no way of corroborating what he's saying. I think where I believe him is where he talks about a lot of the um, activities of his department in terms of foreign agents into West Germany. I, I would believe most of that. I guess where I disagree with Wolf a lot is, or with what he's saying is how he became to be a critic of the GDR. I'm like, were you really, mate? You know, were you really, before the wall came down, were you really a critic of Honecker to his face or to Milka? Or are you just saying that now because, you know, history? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think he... He sort of says that he knew nothing of the um, Red Army faction um, terrorists anyway. that were being given haven in in East Germany as well. Yet he was, you know, part. You know, he was in charge of the overseas intelligence service. So uh, yeah, but I it, don't believe it, him. Yeah, no, no I, I, I don't. But it, I agree. It is an absolutely uh, fascinating um, read, and and does give you, you know, sort of a. a first-hand insight into how effective the uh, East German intelligence was. For uh, such a small country, you know, really, when you look at it, um, what they were able to do, particularly when you think of the, the Gunter Guillaume case of putting a man that close to Willy Brandt, undetected for so long, yeah. as well as the Romeo agents. Um, you know, pretty, pretty incredible what, what Wolf and his guys got up to. Yeah, but I, I guess, you know, they, they've obviously you know both country well you know they they were one country in a, in effect so being able to place agents in west germany was not as difficult as you know britain trying to place an agent in the soviet union or something like that they definitely had that advantage i agree 
but uh yeah i mean the you know the um i think it's gabby gast who they had high up in yes. nato and uh reiner rook who uh he claims that he you know he's another one of these people that claims they prevented world war three but there's quite a long list of those. Um, and I think he, he has a good claim. I mean, I, uh, the short story here was, you know, obviously watching Deutschland 83, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I didn't know anything about uh, Abel Archer. And um, uh, going, to, going to the German Spy Museum and suddenly reading about Rainer Rupp, Topaz, that it was him. He was the one who said to the, to the Soviets, no, no, they're on maneuvers. It's, it's an exercise. It's not the real thing. And you can just imagine, you know, the Politburo getting all this information about NATO movements. I mean, look at what's going on today without getting political in Syria. You don't know what to believe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you imagine it back then, uh, the height of the Cold War. I, I think he's got a good claim. I think, yeah. you know, there could have been a strike. Um, who knows what may have happened? Yeah. Well, I think uh, he tells then. the story that he managed to copy the entire document um, that listed what they were doing in um, Abel Archer. And by mm. providing it to the Stasi and obviously the, the uh, Soviet intelligence as well, because they could see they had all the numbered pages, they knew that nothing was, you know, hidden. Yeah. There. But yeah. it fascinate, you know, fascinating stories. And it does beg the question of, you know, did they find them all? Or are there others out there that are, they have to be you know, nice. just gone to ground and are nice. happily mowing their lawns in Munster or Stuttgart <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that has to be. Yeah, I agree. No, I don't think we, we got them all at all. I think there were plenty that were, were sleepers for a long, long time. Yeah, well, if you find any, send them my way because I'd love to have a chat with them, Shane. There we go. We'll have to get that little voice distorter thing, right? So they will be able to recognize them. And uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, now, your interest in East, because you've got a particular interest in um, East Germany. What, what started that? It's a curious story. Uh, so back in the 80s, I was a bit of a nerd as a kid, and I used to collect stamps. Um, and you used to send away a pound note. Remember those? And <laughs> A pound note, a lot of money then. You, yeah. Once a month, you send it off to this address, and you just get back a um, mixed bag of stamps from all around the world. And for some reason, this guy kept sending me most of the stamps I got was certainly Eastern Europe, and, and the majority of them were from the GDR um, so I had this collection and I thought oh, I'm going to specialize in the GDR stamps. And I would go down to Swansea Library where I grew up because this was pre-Google, can you believe? And, um, you know, try and read up on Dresden or Leipzig or Karl Markstadt, all the places that were mentioned on a stamp or if a person was mentioned on a stamp. And that was my way of, you know, enjoying the hobby and learning some history. And I used to get some very weird looks, of course, um, at Swansea University because there weren't many, you know, spotty 13-year-olds asking for you know, stuff on Brecht um, or Ulbricht <laughs> or whatever it may be. Um, the collecting works of Eric Honecker, yeah. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd be in there looking for this stuff or ordering it. So that was my, my, how my interest started in the GDR. And then, of course, 89, the wall comes down, etc. And I just could not understand as, as a t young teenager how a whole country could just evaporate. And I had this whole collection of stamps I'm like, wow, this whole thing is gone. It's disintegrated. I say vanished. Yeah. How, how can that be? So that, that interest always stayed with me. You know, what happened to that country? What happened you know, to some of the people on the stamps or those towns? And uh, what happened to the people of East mm -hmm. Germany? Uh, so it always kept you know, an interest in the Cold War, um, the GDR. And then I was fortunate to go there. I'm trying to think the first year I went to Germany. I believe it was just a couple of years after the fall of the wall. Um, I think, you know, I actually tell lines about 10 years later, um, late 90s, early 2000s. And just going around and seeing the Cold War sites, just my interest in it, it was renewed. Yeah. Uh, and again, I started, started reading. Unfortunately, I, I don't have my original stamp collection that got lost years ago, but I started collecting stamps again. So I do have a pretty good collection here, picking up books and bits and bobs and, you know, really trying to read as much as I could about the GDR. And I think that the interesting thing about your show and, and your interest in Cold War is, you know, neither of us are, I know you're involved with the historical society, but, you know, we're amateur historians in a way. And I even kind of went saying that, you know, I can't pretend to be an expert on this stuff. I'm just a guy who is fascinated by the era. Um, I will say, and for the record, I, I am not a supporter of communism. 
um, a supporter of Honecker and, and the Berlin Wall, not at all. What fascinates me is you know how that country lasted uh, for the time that it did, um, how it collapsed, what life was like in East Germany, what was the East German mindset. Um, fascinating. And even now, I'm very lucky. My, my the company I work for, our head office is in, is actually in uh, Prenzlauerberg in, in East, East Berlin. And I'm just able to go and wander those streets. And I just have so many questions and, you know, ask myself what it was like to be here. Or I, or I see a, a person of a certain age and wonder, did they grow up in East Berlin? Did they grow up behind the wall? What did they really think about the world? What was their worldview? Um, and it's, it's burning questions that to this day, uh, I still have. And like you, I love Twitter. There are some fantastic people on Twitter that share some amazing photographs or articles. And I'm learning so much about the GDR from Twitter and, and the wonderful people that post on there. Well, we've got, we've got some other interviews lined up from some of those people. So uh, Fantastic. I'll, I'll leave it just standing there. So uh, you're, you're enticed. I am. I, am. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm intrigued by uh, East Germany. I think be, because, you know, I, as, as you know myself, I did visit Berlin before the war came down. Mm-hmm. And it's just that whole you know, a country split in half on the basis of ideology and Berlin particularly, you know, a city split in half. So, you know, like Trafalgar Square or Times Square, having a wall running across the middle of it and, you know, one side is one ideology and the other side is another ideology. I think the the other thing is, and the, these are interviews that I would love to do as, as, you, as you were talking about, is with people who actually lived in East Germany. Yes. And particularly what it felt like when your country just disappeared overnight. I mean, I can't even get my head around that. I, it, no, absolutely. Um, and, and again, there are so many different viewpoints. There are people who obviously absolutely embraced that. And there are other people that are very, very sad about it. Um, the other week, I wish I'd had my uh, recorder with me, my gadgets, because this would have been great for your show. I was flying back from Berlin, got talking to my seatmate who who uh, left East Germany after the fall of the wall, and she lives in Canada and brought her family there. And we talked about her time growing up in East Germany and raising two kids. And not once did she criticize or condemn the government of the GDR. Not once did she bring up the Stasi. All she talked about were the positives of living there. Mm. Um, it was, it was just a fascinating conversation and I just kept stum. You know, I just let her go on. You know, I just, wow, you know, this, this is a fascinating conversation where she was talking about, you know, her free university education, uh, which of course, you know, only certain people got. It wasn't free for everybody uh, and uh, unless you were the... Um, yeah, you had to toe the line to some degree to... And you had to have working class parents. Yeah. If you, if you were the children of the intelligentsia, they didn't want university, which is nuts in itself. And she was also sharing with me that you know a, a cousin, what was it? Yeah, a cousin of hers had gone over the wall, escaped, and her old man, or the cousin's father, was was pretty high up in the in the army. He got drummed out of the army. The whole family got you know taken off and interrogated and watched and everything else. That was the only part of the conversation where she talked about anything negative, and that she was never allowed to speak to that side of the family again. Wow, uh, just just amazing to think the guy got stripped of all his honors and everything else, and. Uh, yeah, well, because you know his daughter escaped, and he probably knew nothing about it. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, um, and just talking to her, you know, the funny thing uh, <laughs> she did tell a funny story, which I think you'll enjoy. So the night that uh, you know the wall fell, pretty much she was working nights in some factory, so she didn't know about what had happened at Bornholmstrasse, and all her colleagues were late to work for the morning shift, and they eventually turn up, you know, stinking of booze and. They hadn't had any sleep. And she's like, this is just not good enough, you know, that you have to come to work. You have a duty to the country. You can't just turn up drunk. And they were like, what are you on about? Have you not seen the news? She's like, no, what? And then they explained to her. And she wouldn't believe them until she went home. I mean, just, yeah, yeah, that's the side you don't see, right? You know? Yeah. But those those stories are really what, you know, what I want to try to make this podcast about because it's, it's just hearing that from somebody because you just immediately think, well, it spread like wildfire and everybody knew about it by midnight, one o'clock in the morning, yeah. but she didn't. I mean, there's no internet, no phones. You know, I, I presume she wasn't listening to the radio at the time or I don't know what East German radio was saying about it, if anything. Yeah. And, and I really wish I'd, I'd taken her email address so I can, could have connected uh, you to her because she was just you know, fascinating to talk to. Well, if you're listening, you know where I am. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
Um, now, you, you mentioned you've collected some GDR or Cold War items. Have you? Can you, you know, give us a little bit of detail on on what you've got? Yeah, it's 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 very eclectic. I was just in my in my little room, so I I moved up to Station V. Uh, two years or so ago, and it was great because I used to live in shoeboxes in New York and London. Uh, so it was great to get the stuff out the boxes. And there's this little den which uh, the previous owners, their kids were in. So, you know, it's it's a little door, adjoining door into one of the rooms upstairs. It's kind of hidden away. And uh, we call that East Berlin. Because <laughs> up on the wall, I'll, I'll send you a photo, maybe from the show notes. I have yeah. a framed portrait of Erich Honecker. Well, I remember you talking to me about that, and uh, what, what was the uh, you, what you told your wife who who that was? Um, no, it dep- what did I tell her? Uh, I think you grand- told her that it was a picture of uh, your grandfather, who was a trade union leader in Wales. That's or that's right, that's right. And sometimes, you know, with others, I have to say it's you know it's a trade union official or it's grandfather or whatever else. But yeah, I mean that's uh, that's it's quite funny. And even I remember having that that portrait up when I lived in Cambridge and people come to the house. It's fascinating. You know, people would recognize Gorbachev, or Khrushchev, or Stalin, but you know, Honecker, we've, we've laughed about this. You know, he looks like a librarian. He doesn't look like a leader of a communist country. Not at all. Uh, very anonymous looking guy. So people just assume it is a trade union official or my granddad. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so I have the portrait up on the wall. I, I do have a, a full Stasi uh, uniform. Um, I have, you know, a, not as many as you, Ian, but I have a fair few books on the GDR and very eclectic there. I have a big, massive book, which is the history of the SED, which I, you need a magnifying glass to read it. I mean, just looking at these books uh, are incredible. I have a lot of uh, military medals and, and badges. I actually have um, a box full of one uh, border guards, uh, a major, uh, Major Canos, I think his name was, uh, his all his medals and certificates from his entire twenty year service uh, in the Grenz Trooper, um, wow. yeah. And I and I, I I bought it on eBay off off a collector, and I tried to find out, hey, you know, do you know anything about the family? Because you know, I really, we want to find out a bit more the story behind these medals. Um, unfortunately, he he didn't know a lot about it, so I have to do a wee bit more digging there. And some other things I've got, which are, I would say not the norm that you that, that you would expect to have. So I've got this whole photograph collection that a U.S. congressman took in the 70s. He was obviously on some study trip uh, to Germany and went to East Berlin, and he took a load of photos. And they were for sale because uh, the guy had, had passed away, and it was part of his estate, and they were just selling everything off. So I got them really cheap. And that's the kind of thing I really enjoy. Yes, when you go to Germany now and to Berlin, there's lots of great books and some picture books. What I really enjoy are that snapshot of the real East Berlin. And yeah, I'm sure he had minders and everything else, but he was able to take his own pictures. And it's, it's a very interesting look at East Berlin. I also have a lot of these coffee table picture books of the DDR. And some of them are propaganda because they're wanting to show the West, hey, look how ultra modern our centers are. And others are, you know, for the population of the GDR. And I really enjoy leafing through those books and, you know, like, like we talked earlier on, just imagining what life was like in, in East Germany and also how it's changed from that, mm-hmm. uh, what it is today. Because as you know, and I guess we shouldn't be lamenting this, I guess it's a good thing, but I can't help but feel a wee bit sad that the Cold War sites and the GDR sites in, in, in Berlin are getting less and less um, as things are being replaced and renovated. Um, there's not as many of those sites around anymore. Or of course, they're still there, but you can't really picture it as a Cold War site. Um, which is good for German progress, but not good for sad old geeks like us uh, that want, want to see this stuff. What What would you say is your most prized item then that you've uh, got there? And you can say it's the bit of Berlin Wall I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that actually though, it's funny you mention it. it. It is definitely up there because you got that from the Berlin Wall. It's not from some guy's, uh, you know, back garden in Kiel. Right. Um, you know, and that's the thing. I always giggle. Even now, they're still selling, you know, fragments of the Berlin Wall. I'm convinced the Berlin Wall must have been bigger than the Great Wall of China because, you know, we're in 2018 and they're still selling bits of it. So, uh, but no, I, that, you know, I, I have that pride of place up on my mantelpiece and I do look at it sometimes and imagine what stories it could tell. Um, I think 
It's, it's a tough question, um, to be honest, because I've got so many great things in my collection. Like I love my stamp collection because it reminds me of my youth learning yeah. about the GPR and there's so much history in stamps. But I think if I had to pick anything, it would be a book that's quite pricey to get hold of now. Um, and it's actually called Hanukkah from my life. Oh, is it? And, you uh, managed to get the English version. Is I managed to get biography, the English version. Biography, isn't it? It is. Wow. And it's in color. And I want to read you, if I may, there's a publisher's preface. And I'll quickly read it for you. And I wonder if you can guess who wrote this. As the publisher of the series Leaders of the World, I have the honor of presenting to the public the third volume, which deals with the life and work of Eric Honecker, General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Socialist Unity Party of Germany and Chairman of the Council of State of the German Democratic Republic. As represented by Eric Honecker, the German Democratic Republic, together with the Soviet Union and the other countries of the socialist community, is a member of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance and one of the states of the Warsaw Treaty. In international politics and in the struggle for peace and disarmament, it plays an increasingly important part. The 30th anniversary of the foundation of the GDR in October 1979 is a fitting occasion for the publication of this book. Do you want to have a guess who wrote that? Are they English or American or? English. English. And it wasn't Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Robert Maxwell. Bang, you got it. You got it. Because hey, he, publi- he ran uh, Pergamon Press, didn't he? And that's who published this book. Yeah. And I'd forgotten about that until I picked it up earlier today. How many, how many pages is it? I mean, does it cover his arrest by the Gestapo and stuff yes. like that? There are uh, 500 pages. Wow. And what's fascinating with this um, is his, he is his uh, address uh, in the appendices, the address delivered at the ceremony to mark the fifth anniversary of the GDR, lots of tables, uh, lots of propaganda stuff. Um, and chapters, you know, written uh, as a child with young Spartacus, illegal activity in the Ruhr, the years in prison, peace flight to the east, uh, youth for socialism and peace. Trust in the strength of the people. God, they don't write them like that anymore, Shane. <laughs> it could go on and on. <laughs> uh, really, um, socialist cultural policy. Uh, but I find this stuff fascinating. I love reading the, the propaganda, and I love reading what they put forward as policy. Yeah. Uh, I love picking up the Marxist-Leninism books. I mean, they're just so dry. They are just so turgid. Yeah, so this, this is a book that I'll cherish because it was expensive. It's hard to find because it's in English. Um, yeah. No, I've, I've been looking for one of those and it's been out of my price range. Yeah. No, I was lucky with this one. Yeah. It was still expensive, but it was in my budget. Yeah. And then there's things, you know, a lot of badges that I've collected. Um, I like the, uh, what, what do they call? There's a particular, particular word when you used to write off to a radio station and get the card back. You got a few of those then? Got a few of those from RBI, Radio Berlin International. Right. Um, which are, you know, and what I like about them, it's not just from the, they're from RBI, it's like they were sent out to people in England um, mm. that, that heard, the, uh, heard their show. And of course, RBI was the, uh, the, the communist radio station that was uh, broadcasting to Western Europe uh, about, the, uh, about the, the, what they considered was the true story of, of the East yeah. to counter some of the propaganda that was coming from the West. It, it gets a little mention on my intro. It's one of the last pieces on there. Brilliant. On the uh, the intro there, but I've also on the intro. I've got um, it's a piece of Radio Moscow, and they talk about so and so from Thornton Lafarge in Lancashire, and I've always <laughs> thought about shall I see if I can find him be <laughs> because he wants to hear about uh, more more news on Anglo Soviet relations or something. Incredible, and that that it's called a QSL card. Um, and I'm not I'm not uh, being clever. I, I googled it, so it's. Uh, a Q code message, apparently. Uh, anyway, so I've, I've got a few of those. And, and also talking about propaganda, I think something else that I really enjoy in my collection is the, um, the Democratic the Democratic Journal Report. Um, that was, I've got about 50 copies of those. Now, that's now, that, real hardcore propaganda, that, isn't it? Oh, it's incredible. Um, so that was edited by John Pete, who we'll probably talk about a little, little bit later on. He defected from Reuters in the West to the East, and he wrote this this newspaper, and it's basically, um, you know, outing people in the West German government with a Nazi past. 
because you know the GDR were always saying that yeah, West Germany is just an, it's a it's a fascist state. Uh, all the ex Nazis are running it. You know nothing's changed. So he went to great levels to out these people in in the in the newspaper, and he. Uh, it's funny if you if you think about in, in modern terms, you know, Searchlight magazine in, in the UK, which mm-hmm. outed Nazis in, in the UK. It's very similar to that, but th- these were all written in the fifties. Um, I haven't read each and every single one of them. I must confess because they are a wee bit dry. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen um, I've seen some of them on uh, uh, eBay. And, yes, you know they're trying to link, you know, almost everybody in the West German government to a to a Nazi past. Yeah, I remember the one I was reading um, in the Democratic Journal report, and it was basically saying how Adenauer had groveled to the Nazis and had written this letter when he was mayor of whatever city he was, I forget now, and how you know they reproduced this letter they got where he'd said to this Nazi, "Hey, I was always good to the Nazi party." Um, you know, and it's like, wow, they've really gone for him. Um, it's just fascinating reading yeah. whether some of this is true or not. It's just, okay, this is what they're churning out. And I think for us, what's interesting, Ian, is this was going out in English. Yes. So it was how they were trying to counter some of the negative press about the communist world and about yeah. the GDR in particular. Yeah. Cause so that's, go, yeah, go on. No, I mean, that, that's also a really important part of my collection. So what, what are you still hoping to collect? What's your, uh, you know, what's on your wish list there? Well, there's not a lot left that I really want, uh, if truth be told. You know, I do sort of scour eBay to be surprised by something. I've got most of the books I want. Uh, and of course, it's very frustrating that m- most of the really good books on the GDR are written auf Deutsch. And my mm-hmm. German is great. So, you know, I've got some here, which one day I hope I'll be able to read. But it does kind of uh, put me off buying those. I think... Um, I was going to say like a Makarov pistol and a Makarov holster, holster, uh, holster would be good, but then I get worried about getting raided. Although, you know, I live in the US, probably legal to have one of them. Um, that would be good. Um, I would also love, we talked about this before, the, the there's authentic GDR border signs that are out there, like plaques. And mm-hmm. I was eyeing one up a couple of months ago and the guy wanted 500 bucks for it. And I tried to get him you know, to talk him down. I can't imagine there's huge demand for this thing, but he played hardball and he's like, well, I'm not in a rush to sell it either. So if you change your mind, drop me an email. So I wasn't able to yeah. get it. And there's plenty of that, um, those sort of things are pretty easy to uh, copy. I would have thought. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing. There is a lot of those um, repros around and, and most sellers are honest about that, which is good. But even this one, I was like, you know, what's the story behind it? And he couldn't tell me. And, you know, when I buy something, I, it's a bit like those medals I bought of that border guard uh, major. You know, I really want to know a bit more about it rather than just, oh, here's a plaque. You know, yeah. I'd love to know which part of Germany it was taken from and, you know, who took it away or whatever else. And I know you can't always get that backstory, but that's what makes the history come to life. Yeah. Yeah, it's the provenance. Yeah. That's what I've learned from Antiques Roadshow anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh. Now, just we talked about Berlin, and I'm very envious that your head office is in uh, Prenzlauer Berg. I'd be mm-hmm. uh, over there all the time. Are there any locations that you would recommend that people visit uh, in Berlin to, to better understand the GDR? Yeah, I think there's a few um, outside of the obvious ones. Obviously, go to the GDR Museum, uh, the DDR Museum there. That's worth a visit. Uh, I like how they try to recreate GDR life. Um, and then kind of off the beaten track, which I know you enjoy as well, mm-hmm. you know, is the statue of Ernst Stahlmann on Greifswalderstrasse. So I was really surprised the first time I came across that because it was quite near the hotel I was staying. And I was just out for a run, running through this park, and there's this you know, very Soviet-style um, statue of Ernst Talman, who was one of the, the, yeah. the, the communists before he got uh, murdered in the Second World War yeah. by the Nazis. He was yeah. the leader of the German Communist Party. So that that's really cool yeah. to go and, and go and see. And Have you heard the, the uh, story about his nose? No. I'm sure I read this somewhere, but it does sound a bit of a dodgy story. But anyway, apparently they put a heater in his nose because in winter you'd get an icicle forming oh wow off the end of it i can't remember where i read that i wouldn't be surprised because he was revered i mean you know he was yeah. like the forefather of the movement up there with rosa luxembourg yeah um yeah um and also i mean what's also fascinating is so that park they also built some some flats as, as they were wont to do in east berlin to 
housed the proletariat and later found out that they built those flats on, you know, fields that were contaminated with some kind of gas. So that all had to be fumigated after the wall came down. Uh, and there's some good footage online of Hanukkah going there for the opening of the statue and, you know, mm-hmm. waving to people up in the apartment blocks when they, they were built. So, you know, you, that's, the, that's the beauty of what we have today is YouTube, just finding these clips and being able to watch that clip and then go to the place and, and try and imagine that happening. So I do like the Instalman statue. Also, the Sport Forum is worth a visit. Now, the Sport Forum is way out in East Berlin and it's where Dynamo Dresden, uh, sorry, Dynamo Berlin would play home games. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the big swimming baths there. And it's, again, very Soviet-style architecture um, for their sports and just going over there and, and you know, I, you can still get into the, the football stadium. It's all overrun, uh, grass growing over the terraces. But just to sit there and think, wow, you know, Milka was here and this is where uh, Dynamo played some of their big games. Although they did move to the stadium, uh, the Jan Sport Park, for a lot of their bigger games. So they kind of straddle between the two. But yeah. that, that's a good place to go. And again, just when you've read these books or watched the YouTube clips, just to go and, and let it all... Uh, you know, sink in. And and by the way, if anybody's interested in East German football, they should listen to episode three because we had a uh, long interview with Craig McCracken about the strange world of East German football. And that was a phenomenal episode. I really enjoyed that and I learned a ton. Um, got a few books here on, on the GDR scene. Um, unfortunately, quite a few of them are in German, of course, but great pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I enjoyed that. And actually, it was funny. I was thinking when I was listening to that episode last week that I actually did get to see one Dynamo Berlin game. And unfortunately, it was an away game. And it was one of the most surreal experiences. It was some small village. I can't remember the name of it now, outside Berlin. And I'd got in contact with some supporters of Dynamo Berlin. And they they picked me up outside the stadium, drove me out there. And it's just weird to see. They were Some of them were... We're very right wing, shall we say? Yes. Very right so wing. I understand. But then the weird thing was some of them still had GDR flags and, and badges and wanted the GDR back. I mean, it was just, just surreal. Wow. Surreal. And in fact, if you go to the sport forum, which is way off the beaten track, um, but I say it's worth going out there. They have, you know, the big pictures of, you know, some of their star players in the past around their old clubhouse and the GDR flag. It's like, you know, a little bit of, walking wow. into time warp um and that's all changing because there's, <clears throat> excuse me there's a lot of renovation going on over there they're also renovating the, the yarn sport park which is fascinating to me for two reasons that that sport park the floodlights are incredible um you've been there right no i haven't so, so it's tell me off- about the floodlight shane i'm on the yeah. edge of my seat yeah this is floodlight porn here we go <laughs> uh they, they just rise up like triffids it's a very 70s retro design that you don't see anymore. And as you walk through Prenzlauerberg towards the ground, they just rise up. And there's something quite moving about them, I think. Mm. Uh, just you don't see those floodlights anymore. And of course, that ground is, is just meters away from the, where the wall was, yeah. where the death strip was. And again, you just say, this was the East Germans building these, at the time, very modern floodlights um, to show off to the West. Look what we've got. Same as yeah. the TV tower. Yeah. Very rich, but right? I think you're right. I mean, you know, to find sort of genuine sort of East German architecture and and design in Berlin is more and more difficult. I mean, you've got the obvious places like uh, Karl Marx Allee um, mm-hmm. with all the, um, uh, you know, the apartment blocks. Um, and also, you know, Alexander Platz, you've still got the um, House of the Teachers yeah. there with that fantastic mosaic on the side. Um, yep. so if you, if you look around, you can, you know, you, you can find these spots. Have you been to the Memorial to the Socialists in, um, uh, Lichtenberg, I think. Lichtenberg. No, I, I was meant to go there last time I was there, but, um, with it being winter time, everything got dark by four o'clock. So I didn't get over there. That's where the, the cemetery is, correct? Yeah. 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 That, that's where, well, I'm not sure the remains of, uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht are there. I think um, they're supposed to be there, right? Yeah, but I'm not sure they, you know, probably found... Because, I mean, the whole place was flattened by the Nazis. Yeah. So, you know... Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's quite a, an amazing place. And when I went there, somebody or, or people had, re- had laid red carnations on almost wow. every 
stone around it and it was you know it was it was quite a amazing um amazing sight and and milka is buried in the same cemetery but he's in some unmarked grave somewhere because wolf's buried there as well isn't he yeah with his brother yeah uh, it's, it's definitely on my list and that that's the kind we're talking about here it's like off the beaten track it's not where you know a tourist guide's going to take you they're going to take you to checkpoint charlie which it is worth going to visit but when you get there and right next to checkpoint charlie you see kfc and starbucks yeah. <laughs> it kind of takes away from what that site was and if you haven't read your history and you know watched the youtube clips you were just it's, it's hard to comprehend that those events happened right there and i always think of you know the start of the movie the spy coming from the cold with richard burton alec Lemus, you know lurking around the hut looking out for his guy to come over the over the over the the border it's, well, it's I, radically different from that now but it's still yeah. yeah i think you do have to still go and see it same as the and i know you've been there which is the chenin palace that the, the palace of tears oh yeah Russia, so, and that's free to get in which is always good that's well worth a visit yes that is. And, I'd, and you know, I remember telling you on the interview I did with you on Spybury about, you know, crossing through Checkpoint Charlie and, uh, you know, crossing at Friedrichstrasse as well and how sort of heavy duty the uh, crossing was in terms of how you were scrutinized. Yes. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I do find – I think Checkpoint Charlie is quite disappointing. Of course um – you have to go to the Berlin Wall Memorial at Bernauerstrasse. I think Bernauerstrasse is just one of those iconic sites. When you look at the photographs, it being split right, the street being split right down the middle. Yeah, um, and the church in the middle of windows. no man's. Yeah, well, wow. yeah. And I think they've done a really good job. Of, this is the opposite to Checkpoint Charlie because you go to the Berlin Wall Memorial, you climb up a couple of steps of stairs, and you can see they've reconstructed the death strip because this is the thing that a lot of people also don't understand. They think, oh, it's just one wall, you know, shimmy over that. It's like, oh, no, no, on the western side, it was just one wall. But the eastern side, there was a few obstacles like, you know, automatic guns set up and mines and Alsatian yeah. dogs and whatever else you had to get before you got anywhere near that wall. Um, and they've recreated that. And again, it's one of those wonderful things in Berlin that's free, so it doesn't cost anything. But it, it, it's, you just really visualize how difficult it was to get over that wall in the end, you know, by, by the 80s when they had all that fortification. Yeah. Um, so I think they've done an outstanding yeah. job. And they have an exhibition in there as well. And uh, I always remember when I was in there last, they have a the little visitor's book, you know, and I was on a little look around and everyone was saying, you know, great history, thanks for doing this. And some guy had, signed, had written on it, give us our wall back in German. And I was like, wow. You know, I mean, this is thing that doesn't really get discussed very often is the fact that there are still people out there that wish the, you know, there had not been, uh, you know, that the the wall hadn't fallen and that the GDR was still there. And it doesn't get spoken about a lot in in the mainstream media. What what Um, did you think of the um, Stasi museum? I enjoyed it. I think it could definitely could do with having more in English. Yeah, um, you know, I haven't been there for a while. Sorry, I, I haven't been there for a while, so I just wondered where they updated it, and I, I know I had the same problem. Yeah, so from the first time I went there, which probably was the mid two thousands, um, to now, yeah, they do have more stuff in English, but it's still not uh, as, as uh, all of it's still not translated, and I really wish they would do it because I think more people would go and visit, more people would understand that history. Um, I think they're making efforts to do that, but it's mm-hmm. still a lot of it's in German. Mm. But seeing Milka's um, office, I think, is uh, probably the the main attraction, certainly for me, anyway. Seeing where he worked from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to to, to walk through his office and even you know see his private kitchen and bathroom. Mm. I think, wow, you know, the guy who was head of the Stasi, um, you know, was here in the little TV that he watched and, and his telephones. And because we're geeks, and I'm sure everyone who listens to the show is a geek, you know, I just looked at those phones and thought, oh, I wonder what conversations were had through there. Yeah. You know? to be a fly on the wall. And, and I really liked how in, in Deutschland 83, um, the TV show, that they, they recreated a lot of those, those rooms um, in the same style. I think they actually might have even filmed it in No Man and Strasser. I couldn't swear to it, but they were very similar. And I also remember the, um, when I was there last, I was listening to um, Berlin Game. Len Dayton and I had the audio book and you know like you I love walking through Berlin and I had the audio book on and it was the end or I gotta be careful I don't have any spoilers here but let's just say there is an interview in the man in Strasser with one of the characters and just the way Len Dayton had described 
no man in Strasser was almost identical to the one I had just looked at. And I remember being really struck by that because I'd come out of no man in Strasser, went on on my walk, and then I got to the part of the book where the character's taken in there for interrogation. And the way Len Dayton described it, and actually in, in one of Rob Mallows, who does the wonderful Dayton Dossier website, he's a Q&A with Len, and I submitted a question, like, how did he get that so right? And, I, and then I, he hasn't answered it yet because apparently he's busy. But I, I was thinking that, you know, probably it, it's not as, you know, as clever as I thought because I'm pretty sure all the buildings were the same in the GDR. So you've been in one, you've probably been in them all, uh, the government buildings anyway. And I remember near our office, there's a customs building and you can go in there and it's like a, a canteen where you can have, you know, a cheap meal. And this was an old GDR building. And again, it looked very similar to No Man and Strasser. I mean, there's not much color in these buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Have you um, been to the um, the prison at Hohen Schoenhausen? That, believe it or not, is still on my list of things to do. Oh, that is mm-hmm. a must see. I mean, it's really powerful. And particularly if you get shown around by somebody who was uh, in prison there. Yes. It really does. And I think that's why I haven't gone, because I don't think they do the English tour every day. Oh, so okay. I wanted to wait for when I was there and I could do the English tour. But yeah, I agree. In fact, one of my colleagues was telling me he lives up near there. Now, I don't know how true this is. I've got no reason to disbelieve him. He said that one of the former guys who ran that prison still lives around the corner. Wow. In his old apartment. And apparently, you know, he, he gets drunk a fair bit and things get shouted out in the street. Yeah. And I mean, this is the cool thing about where one of our offices is in, in Prince Lauerberg. It's in, it's in the part of Prince Lauerberg, which is not the fashionable part, because of course it's been gentrified now. So this is um, on the borders. And, and I walk around there and I've drunk in quite a few pubs, as you can imagine. And some Surely of the conversations. <laughs> some of the conversations I've had there are, are really surprising with the older guys going back to that all, hey, you know, not everything was bad under Honecker. Um, they're the kind of conversations that I really enjoy having because yeah. it's that different side that you don't really get to read about or hear about. Um, it, it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. I, I, I had a, a, some other questions. I mean, do you think, you know, in, in the course of your reading and uh, looking at the, the GDR, is there anything you think that a lot of people may be unaware of that you've come across or has surprised you in – um, you know, what, what you found? I don't know about surprise. I think for me, it's still black and white for a lot of people. East Germany was bad. It was bad for its people. No one liked living there. And I think there is still a large amount of people that um, I guess are nostalgic for the past because, you know, they, they've been in a situation, you just have to look at the, the latest election results in, in the Eastern part of Germany where the, AFD, the right wing party, uh, won a huge amount of vote. Mm. There's still a lot of disenfranchisement in in the former East. Yeah. And that either goes to the extreme right or you have, you know, the leftist party still doing quite well. Um, so I don't think it's as cut and dried as the media will have you um have you said have you think? But definitely with the younger people, I, I saw a great interview with Jonas Nye, is it who played the main guy in Deutsche Daily Three, and they said so are you a West German or an East German? He said, I'm, he said, I was born in 1991. I'm a German. Yeah. So for the younger generation that doesn't come into play, I think for the older generation, they can remember certain things. I I think I read. So if you were a gardener in East Germany, you had it made because I think they had something like a million allotments and you can still see them. In fact, to walk to the sport forum, you can cut through all these allotments. So because everyone was living in these, you know, apartments in the Plattenbau, the East German government gave you allotments. We could go and, and grow food. Childcare was extremely good. There was a place for every kid in in nurseries and uh, you know kindergarten education. But there was always another side to that. So yeah, great that they had these places for children to go. But then when kids were there, they had to learn songs like you know I want to be a vopo. Um, yeah. So the indoctrination started at a very early age. And the same as we talked about with education. I mean, there was free education but not if your parents were rich or part of the, you know, the elite. Um, you, didn't, you weren't allowed to go to university. And in fact, I was talking to somebody else in East Germany who was telling me she was a school teacher, uh, sorry, in East Berlin, who was a school teacher, and she was a fervent believer in the SED. Um, she went to all the events. She was a you know, big supporter. They would not let her become a member. 
and they wouldn't let her become a member. I think it's because her, her parents were quite well off and they were like, even though, and she said, even though, you know, I go to all the events and I teach the kids and everything else, they would not let her be a member of the SED. Wow. I mean, you just, yeah. you just scratch your head and think, well, I mean, so there was that whole Marxism Leninism thing of, well, we want to be for the proletariat, but they took it that step too far. Yeah. Um, the other thing that um, is interesting is, is way before it's ahead of its time is recycling. These Germans were very, very good at recycling everything because A, they needed the raw materials and B, they would get paid for taking the plastics to the, uh, to the refuse dumps, the recycling dumps. So mm. Germany was actually very, very strong on recycling. Now, are these things that justify the state, a one-party dictatorship? No, of course not. Um, but I think these are what uh, older former East Germans are hankering after, that community spirit where the, the lawns got mowed. You know, there was a job for everybody. There was, you know, full employment, even though the country was going bankrupt. I mean, you have to ask yourself, if the wall had not come down, how long could East Germany have carried on for? Yeah. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of questions around that, you know, not just about the one party state, but was that level of support and um, welfare part of the reasons why the country was going bankrupt? I know they had to bankroll that huge um, secret police force. Yes. But, you know, it, you know, whether it, it, you know, that just became um, unsustainable. But we're, you know, we're verging on to politics here. No, well, I mean, Shame, we are. I think it's... Uh, you know, it, it, but it, it is part of the conversation around, you know, the GDR, because I think you're right. It, you can't say it was all bad. You can't you say know, it was all, all good either. There are loads of shades of grey there. There are, and I think it's important to talk about it. I wish more people would talk about it. And I remember my Christmas party last year in Berlin, uh, having a few drinks, and a colleague came up to me and she said, Oh, I'm really surprised. You know, on your Facebook, you have pictures of the, of East Germany. I thought, oh, here we go. I'm in trouble here, right? Because I'm very aware of that. Like, you don't know if this yeah. woman... You know, this will come up in your performance review this year. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Got to be careful. Apparently, one of my colleagues, I don't know which one, but his parents escaped in a boat. And uh, so I, I, I don't make this very obvious at work. But anyway, she came up to me. She goes, oh, you have these pictures. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm really fascinated in the history, blah, blah, blah. And she says, I have to tell you, she said, I was a young pioneer and I was very young when the wall came down. She said, it wasn't as bad as they say. So you had somebody who was really young saying that. Uh, yeah. And that again is, is the fascinating thing. This country has disappeared. And, you know, I asked her, I said, do you miss the GDR? And she said, yes, I do. Wow. And she would have been born probably, oh gosh, Eight like 1980 or something like oh, that. Right. Okay. You know, um, so very, very int- it's very interesting to talk yeah, yeah. about um, the, the, the different things. And she was telling me another interesting story where her, I think it was one of her relatives went to visit grandparents in, in East Berlin before the wall went up. And then the wall went up and he couldn't get home for six months. I mean, I'm surprised he was allowed back at all. But that's also the fascinating thing. You know, where were you when that wall went up? Could you get home again? Were you yeah. stuck? Well, we could have gone on for hours, and indeed we did. So I have split this interview into two episodes. That was the end of episode one. If you liked what you heard, please leave a review at iTunes or your preferred podcast provider. It really does help me to spread the word. The show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash episode and the number four. There's many links to the areas that we discussed. And don't forget to join the discussion at our Facebook page. Just search Cold War Conversations. And you can also follow us on Twitter at, at Cold War Pod. Thank you for listening. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. 